built uh, human dimensions of CWD implications for management and surveillance. Um, I really want to thank all of you for joining today. Uh, my name is Corey Anderson, and I'm a research assistant at CIDREP who works on the, our chronic wasting disease program. Um, and I'm really excited to uh, present or introduce our presenter today, uh, Dr. Vic Adamovich, um, who is a leading expert in this area. Um, Vic is the Vice Dean in the Faculty of Agricultural Life and Environmental Sciences and is a distinguished university professor in the Department of Resource Economics and Environmental Sociology, all at the University of Alberta. Um, he obtained both his Bachelor and Master of Science degrees from the University of Alberta and his PhD from the University of Minnesota. Um, his research is focused on the economic valuation of environmental amenities and ecosystem services and the incorporation of environmental values into economic analysis um, with applications to forestry, water quality, air quality, endangered species, and agriculture. Um, his research also involves the analysis of choice behavior with applications to food demand, recreation, and environmental quality. Um, Vic is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, which was awarded to him in 2007. Um, he also became a fellow of the Association of Environmental and Resource Economists in 2019, and a fellow of the Canadian Agricultural Economic Society in 2011. Um, if you have any questions for Vic during the presentation, uh, feel free to submit them using the uh, Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, following his presentation, we will select some of the questions for him to answer as time allows. And also, if you're interested, a recorded version of this webinar will be available on YouTube um, and will be featured on our web-based CWD Resource Center um, at sidrep.umn.edu uh, forward slash CWD. Um, so if you're interested in rewatching or sharing, uh, feel free to find that there and share as, as you go. Um, so without further ado, I am uh, very excited, very honored, and, and thankful to uh, hand things over to Vic for this presentation. Uh, thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Corey, and thanks to, uh, to you and to the team for inviting me to do this talk. I'm um, looking forward to it. I, um, I'm looking forward to the discussion, I think, more than anything else. I'm going to present some things about uh, what's going on up in, in my neck of the woods, um, compare with a little bit of what's in the literature and what we've seen elsewhere in human dimensions, and maybe we'll get a sense of uh, what are the key issues and, and how are we going forward. So let me, uh, let me kind of move through the presentation. I'll try to do this fairly quickly so we've got enough time for discussion. So I'm at the University of Alberta. Um, I'm an economist, so that's already a subset of human dimension. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that and um, how we fit into the broader schemes. Usually people thank folks at the end of their presentations. I'm going to put it up early because we've actually had a team of uh, researchers looking at chronic wasting disease in Alberta for, for many years. And there's a list of my colleagues and current and former graduate students there and some of our funding, um, fantastic relationships with our government agencies and, and with uh, people in the natural sciences and biology has been also a real, real welcome to, uh, to do interdisciplinary research in this area. So, um, Corey, you mentioned something about me being an expert. I don't view myself as an expert in this field. It's just so broad and interesting and challenging. I'm hoping to learn a lot about a little slice of this. So let's give the folks credit that have really helped me with presentation and helped, I think, inform this work. And I'll be highlighting some of their work throughout. So what, what I want to do in the presentation, I'm talking a little bit about what human dimensions is, at least from my perspective, um, and where economics fits in there. And I think what it, where some of the challenges and some of the opportunities are. I'm going to do essentially a case study, an illustrative case study of what we've been seeing in Alberta and to a certain extent in Canada. I'm going to focus on wild surveys because there's all sorts of different ways that we can think about the impacts of chronic wasting disease. Um, a lot I'm going to show is about hunters and hunter behavior. That's the groups that I've been working with comparing what we're seeing here and what we've seen in other parts of North America. Um, I'm also going to look at different ways of collecting data. We're going to look at individual data um, on behavior and perceptions and risks as well as what we're seeing in aggregate data, just different ways of looking at questions about how people behave and respond to chronic wasting disease. I've got generalizations in there. So throughout, I'm going to try to bring in some other pieces of the literature and see where things seem to be mapping and telling us that there are general results we're seeing. And then near the end, I'm going to really stick my neck out and say a few things about COVID-19 and CWD. Now, this is purely speculative, but maybe that'll 
get some discussion going, and that's where I hope to leave some time at the end. So human dimensions. Um, I'm going to start really broad. I'm not sure exactly what people's backgrounds are, to what extent they're uh, familiar even with chronic wasting disease. So I just put in one of the definitions of chronic wasting disease, you know, misfolded proteins, fatal neurogenerative disease. Uh, it's uh, present in, what's the count now, 26 U.S. states, three Canadian provinces, and European countries, in cervids, um, your population. So, um, and of course, there are questions and concerns about possible uh, zoonotic components of chronic wasting disease and no evidence of transmission to humans, but most agencies, health agencies, advise not consumption of meat that hasn't been tested. So that generates some of the starting point for the questions about chronic wasting disease. So what are the human aspects? Well, there's a really social science aspects of chronic, chronic wasting disease. Um, human behavior. Are people consuming meat, whether it's in restaurants from farm service, or are they hunting and consuming the meat? Are they changing their behavior? Um, are they changing their behavior in terms of recreation? What are their risk perceptions? What are values that are arising in response to chronic wasting disease? Uh, there are motivations behind behavior. Um, we find in much of the literature that trust matters a lot in terms of how they behave and develop risk perceptions and whether they accept policy options or not. Um, policy acceptability is one of those key things that agencies are often very interested in. And I know in my conversations with my colleagues at the Alberta agencies, that, you know, that, that is an issue of understanding what the stakeholders are thinking and whether they would support different policy options or not. And in that fact, that will present us with some of the challenges about uh, how to do anything within the chronic wasting disease world. You know, this is a paper by Vasky in 2010. I've used this a lot in presentations and uh, I think it still holds. And I thought I'd just start with it because it's, you know, lessons learned. Well, CWD affects a lot of stakeholders. I mean, what, and I'll show a slide in a second with the kind of range of stakeholders. That in itself introduces some complexities because we've got lots of different people with different perspectives and either ability to benefit or lose from any policy option. That makes the assessment of options difficult. Um, people are different. We're going to see that in the data that I'm going to show. People have different risk perceptions. They respond differently. They have different preferences over policy outcomes. Um, risk, risk, I should say, this is my, my stylized rewrite of the uh, lessons that Vasky put together. Uh, risk perceptions affect behavior. We see that in a lot of the literature. I work in, in human health risk uh, evaluation, the economics of human health risk reductions in a variety of other uh, issues. And we see the same thing. The risk perceptions will affect behavior. Um, perceptions and trust affect policy acceptability. So it it's, depends to a certain extent on the relationship with agencies and uh, institutions. Knowledge varies and acceptability and, and efficacy of management varies. And I wonder if uh, maybe there's some new lessons that, that we're learning. And these are some things that I've been thinking about and I'd be interested at the end of the talk, but listen to what others are saying. Um, risk perceptions are potentially going to change with information, with context and over time. And that's one of the intriguing things to try to identify is how do these risk perceptions change? If they're driving behavior, uh, what kind of information and how do we present information or how are people using that information? How does the context change? Uh, risk is endogenous. So risk can be modified by people's actions. Um, they can adapt. They can adapt to obtain test results, to be more careful, to hunt in different places, to choose different food products. So they can modify the risk that they face from a particular issue like chronic wasting disease. And I think this last one is just uh, it's coming, coming through to us whenever we think about policy options. The selection of options is challenging because there's uncertainty. Uh, and there's a distribution of benefits and costs. Some people win, some people lose. Some people will be opposed to different changes. Some people will be supportive of them and trying to identify what's best and then identify those groups that are going to be adversely affected. And that's really part of the policy challenge. So this is a slide I mentioned about just the wide range of potential impacts. Um, that, I like that graphic on the right-hand side that's just showing all the different ways that humans are interacting with whether it's farm cervids or wild cervids, um, potential questions about 
agriculture, other agricultural livestock impacts, uh, human impacts. There's even pets listed up there. So a whole host of ways that humans would potentially interact with chronic wasting disease and any, any risks that may arise from chronic wasting disease. And we put together a partial list of the way that people are affected. Um, indigenous people and in communities, um, I'll speak a little bit about that. That's a particularly, uh, I think, interesting and important component of impacts within, at least within my country and elsewhere. Obviously, recreational hunters, outfitters, it's part of their livelihood to maintain populations and they're concerned about management strategies. People who are viewing wildlife, just the general public. The general public is interested in having healthy wildlife populations. Uh, for farming sector service and those groups are making up their livelihood. Uh, consumers enjoy venison at times or other types of meat products. We've got a whole host of groups, um, other wildlife species concerns, and even the last one, international trade issues. And if there are questions about um, risks increasing and transmissibility changing, then borders can close. So we have a whole range of issues and concerns that we have to worry about. Um, again, that brings us to part of the problem is it's just widespread in terms of the potential impact. Now, of course, I'm an economist, so I'm just one small slice of the broader human dimensions group. And of course, we have very specific things that the way that we think about problems. Um, so I'm really interested in the costs and benefits of different management strategies, whether this is management actions to reduce spread and prevalence in wild populations or to increase surveillance. Um, how do we measure those economic values? How might we actually calculate the benefits of a particular strategy versus the costs of an agency implementing that? Um, we will do that with a variety of different methods to try to really understand the trade-offs. Um, and this is quite narrow, but we try to measure those trade-offs in dollar terms. And yes, there are acceptability issues and a whole host of other things, but that gives us a way to actually assess um, whether the benefits do exceed the costs. And those are mostly done through understanding how people behave, because when people make choices like going on a hunting trip or consuming venison, they're making a choice and that tells us something about their value. Or uh, we'll ask them very highly structured survey questions that also will tell us something about their value. But really, I also need to understand their perceptions, their knowledge base, the trust and other types of things to better understand behavior. Um, I'll show some examples shortly, but how, how would we do this? Well, we'd get data from various sources. Uh, data, we usually rely on surveys, um, changing survey technologies through the years. But now increasingly, we're relying on internet-based surveys. Um, that's uh, got its own set of issues. I've got a list below of concerns. So there's selection bias in surveys. There's potential for what we call strategic behavior social desirability bias, people wanting to conform with the norms or measurement error issues. So there, there are a number of concerns we have about surveys, but they're one of our best data collection tools. Um, increasingly, we've been seeing some other possibilities for data collection. Uh, a colleague of mine, Lucy Shea, is working, who actually been doing laboratory economic experiments with hunters and non-hunters and fascinating set of issues we're raising there, trying to actually control more of uh, what the experimental design is and trying to learn responses to behavior within a laboratory setting. Pluses and minuses, but gives us a different way of collecting behavior. Uh, working on another project, maybe can come up in the discussion about using activity-based apps on smartphones to collect data and to have volunteers, um, in our case, hunters, provide us with information about activities and wildlife viewing and uh, conservation issues and a host of other things. And we can also use aggregate level data license sales, aggregate expenditures. One of the things that's really a challenge within the social sciences in general, and, and economists, as an economist, I'm always struggling with this, is can we actually identify a, a response to a particular change? Can we actually claim that there's causality? Um, normally, we'd like to do randomization or have some source of exogeneity. We'd love to do randomized controlled trials pretty tough to do in the social sciences. I mean, that's why we're thinking about things like ec economic experiments or other types of uh, strategies where we could really identify what the cause and effect is. But that is an overriding concern that will just find its way through all of our literature. And I think that's something that in general we're working on to try to improve. 
Okay, that's a broad introduction. Now I'm going to speed up a little bit and tell you a little bit about my context to give you a flavor about where I'm coming from. And it'll be interesting, I think, then to compare. And it's one thing I'm interested in. What are the experiences elsewhere of folks on this uh, on this seminar? So a little bit about chronic wasting disease in Alberta. Uh, everybody that's worked in chronic wasting disease has seen these maps. You can see the, the distribution of chronic wasting disease in wild and in farmed populations. There's Alberta. A little square there, sorry, beside the square that's Saskatchewan. Uh, this is what we've seen over the years of chronic wasting disease. We've, we've had an extensive now over 20 years of uh, data collection and surveillance on chronic wasting disease, which is really remarkable. Um, and colleagues in, uh, in the government agencies remind me that this is really collected for deer monitoring and surveillance for the health of deer populations. So there are not interested as much and that's not their their mandate is not to, to collect issues around human health but of course these things can be used for human health interpretations we've seen the prevalence levels go up across different species mule deer mostly in our province and male mule deer in particular and this gives you a bit of an idea a 10-year period we've gone from relatively low prevalence rates now to some and this is male mule deer the prevalence rates of uh, 30, 40, 50% on the Eastern border. And so it's quite a dramatic change in what those rates are. And of course, we're interested in what the behavioral response to that is and what the management strategies might be that would make sense or have benefits that are greater than costs. Now, a couple of other interesting issues, at, at least from my perspective. Um, this is again, a map of Alberta and that's the range of woodland caribou and in particular the boreal caribou in the Northern parts of the province. Um, these are somewhat iconic species in Canada, and they're also threatened. And in these cases, almost every single herd of woodland caribou in Alberta is below a self-sustaining status. So they're in trouble, and some of them in significant trouble. And of course, it's a cervid, so it's one of the ones that we're concerned about. And if on the right-hand side, I put up the map of this is our wildlife management units, and I just, this is my... Uh, uh, poor economist version of GIS overlays. If I just draw a line, this is basically the northern extent of where we've been either seeing chronic wasting disease or the mandatory um, areas for submission of heads for chronic wasting disease. And you can see it's pretty close to that boundary of where the caribou are in a threatened species. So that raises a number of questions and concerns that may be a bit different than other parts of the world. And um, I've worked a lot in boreal caribou conservation and the economic benefits and costs of that. There's a, there's a very high value for protection and conservation of boreal caribou. So that will be an issue, I think, that uh, uh, raises questions about priorities and investments. This also raises another question, just thinking about these maps in the northern part of our province, not only, but in the northern part of our province, um, we have uh, populations of indigenous people. And indigenous people are particularly susceptible to questions around traditional foods and harvest of traditional foods. And I'll just raise a couple of questions or points here. Um, colleagues Brenda Parley and others have done a lot of work in Northern Alberta, but also in the far north of Canada where there, there are questions about chronic wasting disease and other wildlife diseases. And really thinking about how do we in integrate traditional knowledge into mon monitoring for wildlife health and communication. Um, different issues in terms of trust and knowledge creation uh, traditional knowledge is trusted as an information source. How do we work with Indigenous communities or actually led by Indigenous communities to really identify the ways to communicate and, and to identify the concerns around wildlife diseases, potentially chronic wasting disease? Um, this is paper by Chu et al. Again, fairly recent, really fascinating study that's less concerned about potential human health risks, but if there are declines in populations, um, of wild cervids, for example, that are very important to Indigenous people, that then means that people will have to substitute away to other meat products, which could affect diet. Um, these are expensive in northern locations, so that really raises a whole host of questions around food consumption um, that's largely around substitution and the impacts on a group of people um, particularly important to them in their diet of these uh, natural foods and traditional foods. And just to give you some sense of the importance of, uh, of traditional land use and foods, David Natcher's work in about half of households in uh, some of the, the indigenous communities in the north in Alberta, he was studying 
are consuming traditional foods and then in some cases are an average of 20% of their household diet. So a substantial component, but also very important cultural sharing networks involved in traditional foods. And really interesting discussions there about potential for cultural tipping points where if those popular or those food sources are not available or much more difficult to get, there may be substitution to other approaches um, for diet and for food consumption that will lose that, that traditional component of activity. And what that led to is a very interesting outcome about a year ago that the Alberta Organization of Tribal Chiefs, which is one of the high level organizations for our treaties, uh, passed a resolution last year supporting a collaborative research initiative on CWD surveillance. So this is a, this is a high profile issue. And again, it signals some of the importance and values um, of the chronic wasting disease case. So let's go into a little bit of the kind of data that we've been looking at or that I've been looking at. Again, I've just shown you some issues around the Indigenous communities. We've been focusing mostly on resident hunters, and I want to walk through these data and some of the things that we're learning and maybe compare with some of the literature. So we've done surveys started back in 2007, relatively small. These are surveys of resident licensed hunters questions uh, about what they have done so we can collect information on what they're doing, questions about what they would do. We call these contingent behavior questions. And then we're trying to design from that measures of the economic value of different strategies. A little background, Alberta's got about 4 million people. Interestingly, we're one of the places where licensed hunters are not declining or at least not significantly declining, um, touted as being one of the few places where there seems to be strong interest in hunt, hunting that's been maintained. Um, past couple of years, there have been over 4,000 requests for draw licenses submitted. So strong demands so of diverse population of hunters and, and a fairly large group of young hunters as well. So maybe a different demographic than in other locations. Uh, where do people get their information from chronic wasting disease, the bars over time? And the government is still an important source of information, obviously, other sources are also popular. I'm not sure what happened in 2019 with the spike of social media. Maybe there was something happening there that all of a sudden everybody joined Twitter, but again, a diverse set of information sources. And we think they started to ask people about behavior and we, we know a little bit about what they're actually doing, but asking folks here, have they considered changing hunting locations because of chronic wasting disease? And the response is largely no. People are different. I think that was one of ASCII's early points. It's not one person that represents everybody in the public. People are quite different, but there's largely a consensus that uh, people are not changing their behavior in response to chronic wasting disease. But that doesn't mean they're not concerned about wildlife health or about human health issues. And we asked people for the last couple of years, why did you submit heads in the mandatory submission zones for chronic wasting disease? And a lot of people said because it was mandatory. Um, but an even split between worried for health risks and worried about wildlife populations as the primary reason. So it's not that folks are unaware of these issues or that they're not concerned about them, but it hasn't moved to a point where they're changing their behavior. Um, and I think this is one we've been asking for several years to people to eat or give away their meat before they receive a test result. And again, a lot of people say, no, I wait for the test result. But there's a fairly significant group that doesn't wait for test results. They don't perceive the risk as being high. And so they either eat or give away the meat. Um, so again, diversity, heterogeneity and preferences and risk preferences and responses. Do people think it's a risk to human health? Um, neutral, kind of a mixed perspective on whether it is or not. Some strongly do, some strongly don't, but on average, pretty neutral. Do they think it's a threat to wildlife he health? Yes. So there are certainly concerns around the extent to which um, wildlife populations will decline if there isn't a management strategy or action. So let me compare that in just a little snippet of what other folks have been doing and what we've seen recently. This is some work by Vasky and Miller, um, recent paper, but was looking at the trend in risk perceptions across different categories. Have a look at the chronic wasting disease one. This is uh, a decline over time, a fairly significant decline over time in risk perceptions from 2004 to 2012. So that's before we started doing some of our survey work. Uh, and if you even look at it across different clusters or categories of risk preferences, again, for chronic wasting disease, we see some declines in risk perception. There's a whole host of reasons that might uh, be the background for this, that it's now become somewhat normalized, people have adapted. Um, there's literature in the risk area in general that people will uh, 
will normalize risks or that when the risks first become identified, they're, they're amplified. Um, there also tends to be less news about chronic wasting disease. Uh, some of Ellen Goddard's work on using Google Trends shows that there has been ups and downs, but declines. So I think these kinds of uh, changes in risk perception, of course, will also affect possibilities for management and possibilities for engaging hunters in management activities. So let's turn to those management actions. It's a busy slide, but we asked our hunters and have asked hunters for years about preferences over management options. We say that's one of the issues that's important for agencies is to know acceptability. Um, and we've compared things that other jurisdictions have tried. What we're seeing just repeatedly is uh, interest in expansion of hunting seasons or extra tags in specific locations to try to try to reduce populations to try to address spread or prevalence of chronic wasting disease. Um, and for, an, for an economist, I, my immediate uh, textbook reaction is we should just provide monetary incentives. Well, that's just not something that's desirable. So that's again, knowing about the culture and the norms is really important within, uh, within these kinds of contexts. So given this interest in management uh, approaches and particular changes of, of hunting seasons, uh, we've done some work um, over the past several years of just trying to understand the economic benefits of this. Again, this is a little case study, but might be useful to try to see, well, what would be the economic value of a management change? And supported again, that hunters by and large feel that they can play a role in management um, and that government programs would be more effective if hunters were engaged. So what do we do? We've developed um, an economic model that explains behavior. I know that's a challenge to do, but we're trying to understand why people go to certain places, why they go on so many trips and not fewer trips, um, develop what's so-called a multiple discrete continuous model of demand, really trying to explain hunter behavior as a response to how much does it cost to get there? What are the chronic wasting disease conditions? What are the other conditions at those different sites? Um, a bunch of characteristics of those, and also trying to identify I and mean, trying to actually worry about the causality of these systems by using actual data to really anchor what people are doing, but also using some very structured questions that will provide us with some randomization or exogeneity around those different changes in the management actions. So what do we see? Well, this is a, it's kind of a complicated table, but the first thing we see is the prevalence of chronic wasting disease is not significant. It's not significantly affecting the number of trips or the location choices within our samples of hunters. Now uh, that extended season has a negative sign. So people, extended season as an option is not as desirable as hunting in the regular season, but the extended season into December is desirable to hunters. So we're seeing some preferences over different timings of policy options and there are other demographic characteristics that affect their outcomes as well. And at the very end, there's that variable contingent behavior. When we compare the actual data and the preferences we measure from real data, if you like, or actual trips with our highly structured scenario changes, there's no statistical difference, which is reassuring to us that our behavior changes are working in a direction that matches with uh, what we'd expect. So what does this mean in terms of economic value? Well, there's some benefits associated with management changes that would extend the season and provide an additional hunting opportunities depending on location. So we could imagine targeting particular regions, um, identifying those as potential for extended seasons and their monetary values associated with them that are positive and significant. Of course, it depends where, and it depends exactly how many options are available, but this gives us a way to measure the benefits, if you like, of a policy change that can be compared with the management costs and administrative costs. This doesn't give us the efficacy in terms of biological outcomes, but I would say it's an important piece for what those outcomes might be. So what do we learn? We learn about their behavioral responses. It doesn't seem to be a strong response to chronic wasting disease. We do see people substituting over space and time in response to management incentives. And we're finding this non-monetary policy to be potentially beneficial in terms of economic well-being, economic activity, using season extensions as an incentive. Now, one other example that we've just been recently doing on monetary values is we've been working with hunters to try to identify their support, a monetary support for testing or surveillance options. Um, this is fairly recent, so kind of hot off the presses, but we've been structuring questions around um, increases in hunting licenses and hunting license fees that would generate 
either more rapid testing outcomes, and that's one of the challenges here is trying to get the tests done and results back to hunters. Those were done by private agencies or public agencies, or increase surveillance more broadly around chronic wasting disease outside of the, the current areas. Um, and what's interesting is that surveillance seemed to be the most highly valued outcome for the resident hunters that we've been working with, uh, more highly valued than private or public testing agencies. So you know, that's a fascinating outcome and, and useful for us to examine benefits and costs of different kinds, different types of policies or strategies. There seems to be this preference for surveillance. All right. So that's the individual level data that we've been working with. And I think that gives you a, a sense of the kind of techniques that we would use and the types of things that we're learning. I'll go through fairly quickly an example where we've been using aggregate data. So these are draw licenses over time. We've got aggregate data from the province that tells us the demand for different licenses. And we're comparing those over time as chronic wasting disease changes. We're really trying to get a sense of whether we see any impacts on demand because of changes in chronic wasting disease. So uh, there's a couple of photos there. That's uh, John Patterson Williams who works with us, a colleague is there's a deer. There's one of the drop off sites for his deer head with his uh, showing his uh, tag. Um, John likes to show those photos all the time. So thought I'd put them in this talk. What are we doing? We're looking at draw license data over time, aggregate data. We're examining what affects those demands for draw licenses. Is it really demand for access to those species? Um, a whole host of different ways to identify the data, um, to try to show whether they're a causal influence or not. And what's the bottom line? We're not seeing any impact of chronic wasting disease on the demand for draw licenses over this time period. Um, draw licenses are increasing in areas with uh, CWD positive cases and prevalence that's quite high. So perhaps because the prevalence levels haven't hit a point where hunters are significantly concerned about these issues, they're still not seeing a response. Maybe they have other ways to adapt, waiting for test results, other types of approaches. There's some results in here, but maybe I'll just point to that very last bullet. I mean, these, these are quite similar in some ways to what we're seeing in some of the US states. There are similar findings, Holland and House et al. Um, looking at harvest data over time, uh, looking at how that's responded to chronic wasting disease changes over time. They're finding similar things that no response um, to hunter demand, if you like, and the hunter outcome in response to chronic wasting disease. So that in a way could be a good news story that says there's still efficacy of management actions and there's still engagement of hunters. So a couple of generalizations. Um, there was some literature, and, and some of those papers are papers that I was on. In the early days, we were finding adverse impacts of chronic wasting disease economically, so economic losses associated with chronic wasting disease. And that seems to have changed somewhat, whether it's change in risk perceptions or individuals who were adversely affected hunt elsewhere or other adaptive behaviors. Um, we're not seeing that in our data anymore. And that's one of the lessons learned is that people can adapt and things can change around the efficacy of hunters in management, that's also a mixed question that uh, you know, the modeling results suggest it's mixed. And it, it depends not only on hunter preferences, but also on risk perceptions and trust issues and agreement with objectives. And some very good work, of course, out of Wisconsin on the extent to which these things work or don't work. I think our results are not that different in some ways from what we're seeing in the other literature. There's concern about initial outbreak, so-called social amplification of risk, but then things start to uh, perhaps become more normalized and risk perception, of course, decline with familiarity. They change with trust in agencies. At some point, chronic wasting disease may lead to declines and whether that's risk preferences or wildlife population impacts or availability of alternative locations or substitute activities or perhaps delays in test results. Um, these are all things that we would be better served to get an identification of what's actually causing those outcomes. Let me change gears to look at the general public. And that's another dimension of chronic wasting disease. They have interest in wildlife health overall. They also have interest if they're consumers of, uh, of venison and other game meats. So this is largely work by Ellen Goddard. Um, done a, a ton of work on the general public and public preferences. And I'm pleased that she shared some of her results with me to use in the presentation, but also Marty Luker and others. Um, Ellen's been doing work over many years. And again, there isn't much work in this area. I really applaud her for doing that. Let's have a look at what we've seen in some of the trends. These are Canadian data, 2009 to 2018. 
Um, these are net percentage agreement graphs. So on the right hand side, you're seeing people are largely agreeing. What have we seen? Will CWD cause infections in humans? There have been early on um, disagreement. 2018, more agreement. In general, we're seeing 2018, there's kind of a heightened interest or concern around chronic wasting disease in the public data out of Canada. If we uh, break this up into provinces, I chose to slide this because it's got one interesting issue. Um, pick this one, I or my family have concerns about eating meat. The lowest risk perception is actually in provinces that um, have chronic wasting disease. Saskatchewan has an uh, actual disagreement with that outcome, for example. Um, so again, that may be the familiarity issue, the normalization of these risk issues that affects these kinds of risk perceptions. What about management strategies? Well, general support for management by hunters, targeted culling, um, support, support for doing something. And notice again, over time, 2009, 2011, 2018, there seems to be an increase in support for management activities um, that perhaps wasn't there in the early days. Um, and of course, support for additional tags to hunters, for focusing on hunters as uh, part of the management options. Again, one of the trends around acceptability that we've seen. One other quick one from the public, this again is from national surveys. This is uh, Jeff DeRoche and Marty Lukert's work. I'll just circle one of them here. Um, interesting here that there's a divergence in support for management action on restricting movement of carcasses and hunted products. Public is generally supportive of it. Hunters and landowners are opposed. This is, again, this raises the challenge of policies around chronic wasting disease, stakeholders with divergent opinions and different views and different dimensions. And of course, I think we've seen these in other types of locations that having some sort of sharpshooter or other types of uh, uh, organized hunt um, generally is not something that's preferred by the public at all. So that raises questions about efficacy of management actions. And I think again, raises some of the challenges of management in these contexts. So generalization, a couple of other interesting ones. Uh, Murngay and Goddard have some very interesting work recently comparing the US and Canada. Um, interestingly, less awareness of chronic wasting disease in their US survey responses compared to Canadian. Not sure why, that's just an outcome. And again, they're showing the strong relationship between trust, either general trust or trust in agencies and risk perceptions and support for different management actions. Um, seems to be some increase in risk perceptions over time in the Canadian data. Uh, Baskin Miller and others seeing that that perhaps is going the other direction in some of the US data that they've looked at. Again, it's changes in different locations, not the same in different places, depends on institutions, depends on information. All right, just about near the end of this, this is where I, I stick my neck out a bit. Um, what is COVID-19 perhaps going to do? Um, around chronic waste and disease and hunting. And I'd be fascinated to hear what other people are thinking about or what they're worrying about in their jurisdictions. We know it's gonna have an effect on the economy. It's already obviously had an effect on the economy. We don't know how long that's gonna last, whether we're gonna have a V-shape or a W-shape recovery or a U-shape recovery. But if that does result in increases in unemployment and declines in income, there's actually evidence in the literature that that would mean additional hunting demand or increases in hunting demand. We've seen a little bit of that already in some of the spring seasons in this province. I know there's some discussions uh, elsewhere, other jurisdictions that have seen similar things. And that may affect uh, indigenous harvesters as well as resident hunters and non-indigenous hunters. Now that raises a whole host of questions around the potential there for opportunities for surveillance, um, but also other questions about demand on hunting resources. It's also possible that the whole issue has raised uh, awareness and concerns about risks and maybe potential zoonotic risks. And it'll be fascinating to look at the data and see how those risk perceptions change when we start doing surveys and other types of data collection now that COVID-19 is with us. Um, of course, COVID-19 is gonna affect budgets and whether it's provincial, state, federal budgets, what is that going to mean for surveillance programs, uh, for research, and obviously a self-serving comment for somebody who's a researcher, and that's something that's a concern is the extent to which um, investments in these kinds of programs might be at risk because of some of the budgetary questions. I think there's also some potential lessons that we could learn from, from COVID-19 is what we've seen, the importance of the role of science, of communication, the fact that people adapt. They're adapting and you know, it's, it's not been 
not been beneficial for most people, but people are finding ways to adapt. And that, again, is something we see in a response to chronic wasting disease risk. And to a certain extent, we've seen cooperation to achieve public goods outcomes, whether that's uh, you know, obeying lockdown orders or wearing masks in public. So we do see some ways to try to achieve cooperative outcomes through the response to the pandemic. Can we take those lessons learned and start thinking about how we would apply them for management actions around chronic wasting disease? All right, let me wrap things up and I'll hit my 40 minute mark pretty close. Um, so what have we learned? We learned that there, at least in our context, there's not much change in hunting behavior in response to chronic wasting disease. Variety of reasons that could be why that's the case. That hasn't been the situation in uh, other jurisdictions, but that's part of the human dimensions research puzzle is why are we seeing that? Is it risk perception? Is it alternatives? Is it adaptation? That doesn't mean that people are not concerned about wildlife health or even about human health. Um, risk perceptions may be declining or stable depending on where we are. Uh, but there doesn't seem to be that change that will affect economic behavior. And turning that around, it sees, at least in our case, there's some opportunities and potential economic benefits associated with involvement in chronic wasting disease management, perhaps because of agreement with agency objectives, uh, trust in the system, not total agreement. Some people will be adversely affected because they don't agree with those particular outcomes, but there are some options that will increase economic value and that would pass what an economist would say is a benefit cost test. Um, it's also interesting to see the support for monitoring by the public and also for management by hunters, which is uh, part of the puzzle is having that support for policy actions. And certainly a willingness to uh, fund and to support surveillance, whether it's hunters or the general public. Um, and I think that's one of the critical pieces is to have that uh, willingness and willingness to, port, to support these types of investments to track and identify outcomes. Last couple of slides. Uh, back to the general issue of, of human dimensions of CWD. Um, this is a challenge. Variety of stakeholders, they have different preferences, um, different perceptions of what the problems are and what might fix them. There's a lot of uncertainty around the situation. And just in terms of in, statistics or science, it's hard to identify causality in, in these activities, but also in, in general in social sciences. Lots of new techniques and approaches that we're trying to use, but I think that's, that's kind of the next step is to really work on that identification randomization issue. Um, we're trying to assess costs and benefits and acceptability, but of course those are challenging measurement issues. The two examples I presented in engaging hunters in management, well, there may be public and hunter support, there's not acceptance by everybody. There are, there are groups that will be adversely affected, potentially outfitter groups, others engaged in other approaches of wildlife uh, uh, tourism are not as interested in some of those uh, management responses. So there will be winners and losers, if you like, and that's always a challenge within these uh, dimensions. Enhanced surveillance, there seems to be general support for that, but then we have to think about what the cost of those. Now, those are just two of a whole host of different policies and management options. I've focused on wild populations, but there are questions around farms populations and testing requirements and coordination of testing and regulation. Um, I've got the site to the Gillen et al. That's the Western states and provinces guidelines for management. The whole range of things that I think raise all of these questions about do the benefits exceed the costs? Are they acceptable? Um, will they pass a distributional set of questions? And just three issues for future research that I've sort of listed. I think the work with Indigenous people in my context is incredibly important. Um, traditional knowledge is, is important. Community-based work is important. Communities can play a role in monitoring. And I think that's an area where working with communities and having them generate the research questions and work with us, I think that's really one of the important ways forward. I think future research around risk perceptions and responses to information and trust and behavior, those are all continuing issues. And that last one, really getting better data collection so that we have a better sense of behavior and, and values and knowledge, and we have a better chance of actually identifying, in some sense, some of the causal structure of these impacts as that continues to be a question for, for all of our work. So I've covered a wide range of things. I'm hoping to engage in some discussion and I will just stop with the questions and comments slide and look forward to some of the discussion.
Thanks. Well, thank you, Vic. I appreciate that a lot. Uh, thank you for this amazingly informative uh, overview that kind of describes some of the human dimensions of CWD and what that might mean for uh, disease management and surveillance kind of moving forward here. Um, it looks like we do have a few questions, so I'll just get started on those. Um, the first says they have a question about your findings on the importance of surveillance for hunters. Um, they said the slide implied that hunters are willing to pay more for surveillance than for private or public agency testing. Can you explain the difference there? How are you and or hunters defining surveillance versus testing? Yeah, so uh, to be honest, that was also a surprise to me that things turned out that way. Um, for us, it's a, the constraint is that people would like to have test results back faster. And you know, if you're lucky early in the season, you harvest and you get it in the queue for test results, you'll get it back. But there are, because of constraints in the systems, there are limits in how quickly we can get test results. So we focused on those two different approaches for test results, which was investing to get your test result back within a month of submission, um, trying to assess whether there would be a demand for such a program, either privately or publicly. Again, these were randomized across people and randomized in terms of the the amount that they were asked to pay. That's one of the mechanisms that we use to try to identify this. And so we got those responses, which again, there's more support for the public, investing in the public agency to try to return tests more rapidly than the private agency. Now the surveillance question was to broaden surveillance beyond our current CWD areas to do more testing outside to identify where CWD may be present or absent or whatever it may be spreading. So it's a very different sort of strategy, but again, interested in whether hunters would be in willing to invest. Again, this is increases in license fees to engage in that kind of a strategy described in some detail in the survey question. And that one was the one that had the highest value to the allocation of hunters that we were uh, surveying. And I think there was a, over a thousand hunters in that sample. So randomized across those groups. So exactly why is that the case? I'm not sure. I think that's just revealing the demand for these different actions. Um, and it seems that people are more interested in knowing more about the extent and, and spread and prevalence of chronic wasting disease and willing to invest in that than they are in speeding up the test results. There's value in speeding up test results, but they're more interested in the other aspect. Again, it could be because there are alternatives, they're willing to wait. Um, maybe they're not as interested in the test results, but there does seem to be an enhanced interest in surveillance. So interesting, this is the first time we asked that question. So it's a bit of a puzzle still, um, but I've actually also found that outcome quite fascinating. Perfect. Um, the next question we have here are, any insights or research as to how CWD risk is perceived by the meat processing industry? Uh, that's a good one. So I don't have any insights on that, but that is one, a couple of dimensions on it. Um, you know, as part of our work, we do focus groups and one-on-one -on -one cognitive interviews and uh, you know, go to hunter meetings and such. And there are you know, a number of people saying that they're, in some cases, their processors are saying, we now want to make sure that this, this particular animal is tested negative. So I'm gonna have a test result that's negative before I process it. So there's some concerns from the processors. There's some hunters raising concerns with processors saying they wanna make sure that uh, the equipment that they use and that the environment they're in is free of chronic wasting disease. So we're seeing in, in a way a kind of demand from some of the harvesters for identification of chronic wasting disease free status, and also some of the actual processing facilities that seem to be moving in this direction. I don't have any hard data on that, but that's what we're hearing in the discussions and, and conversations. And that would be a really interesting next step um, to what extent that that can be uh, part of the strategy associated with chronic wasting disease management. If others have information on that, I would, I would be really interested in hearing about it. I think that is one of the fascinating steps within this story. Agreed. Um, let's see, we have another question here. Uh, the role of science and experts in COVID has become highly politicized. Regarding CWD, has political affiliation been examined as a variable in perceptions to CWD at all? Now, that's a really good question. I, um, I'm sure it has. Off the top of my head, I can't think of a particular study that has done that, but uh, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, these things are often correlated. So there are issues around 
values, norms, uh, trust in agencies, political affiliations would likely be connected together in various ways. Um, so it's, it's quite possible, but I think off the top of my head, I can't think of any study that's actually identified that. It sounds, it sounds like a good project for the next graduate student. <laughs> agreed, agreed. There's always graduate student work to go around here. Um, and I actually had a, a question that paralleled that in, in some sort of way. Um, so you mentioned where hunters are getting their information from, okay. um, and that could vary from you know government agencies to uh, social media, et cetera. Have you analyzed um, basically people, uh, where they get their information from and whether that plays a role in, in what they see as acceptable um, when it comes to management or, or not? Yeah, so there, there are at least a couple of dimensions. We've done some of that in the past, and I know others have done some work within this literature. Uh, yeah, there does, there does seem to be some relationship, if you like, between uh, information sources and pref preferences, risk perceptions, et cetera. It's a question of causality there, which, which one is leading which. And that, as I say, that's always a challenge within this literature. Um, there's, al there's also this... Uh, a confirmation bias question that arises. And again, there's some evidence of that within this literature and other literatures that people will seek out information that supports their current view. And so that's where, again, that causality is kind of a question. If I have, you know, I have a low risk perception, maybe I seek out information that supports that there's a low risk associated with chronic wasting disease. There's in the literature in, in the risk area, there's, there is a fair amount of evidence around that. I think taking that a step forward, I think there are attempts to try to identify what communication sources, information sources would be viewed as trustworthy. How do we actually uh, construct those kinds of approaches to information? And um, how do we get that out to the various members of the public? And we've got lots of lessons to learn from COVID in that sense. Um, but I, I think we can adapt some of those within the chronic wasting disease literature as well. Interesting. Um, let's see, we have quite a few more questions here. I'll try to, to pick and choose. Um, let's see, have you seen any evidence suggesting that hunters have noted the recent findings by Dr. Stephanie Schub and colleagues that CWD can be transmitted to macaques? Yeah, yeah, and it, and it comes up in uh, fish and game meetings when I go to them. It comes up in a, in a you know, again, some individuals have heard about these results. Uh, there is, I mean, that, that is, uh, is my understanding. I have to be a little careful. It's not my literature, but that's not definitive. There are other studies showing that there's not transmission um, to macaques. So there's, uh, there's still some questions around that. But yes, hunters have, some hunters, again, depending on their information sources, have uh, heard about these studies and that raises some of their questions and their concerns. Again, that's, that's part of the heterogeneity, um, you know, just going back to anecdotes and focus groups. I mean, there are individuals who come to our groups and they have documents about chronic wasting disease that they've gone through and they've highlighted and they have detailed knowledge about the issues and then other folks who uh, this is relatively new to them and they're just being made aware of these issues. So the heterogeneity in the, in the public and in the hunting community is, is really massive. Um, but we, we definitely do hear um, questions of arising from those from that particular study, but also from other studies that are raising concerns about chronic wasting disease. Great. Um, let's see here, trying to sift through these questions. Um, let's see, we have a question that says, you mentioned a desire by Alberta, Alberta hunters to have more harvest and or tagging opportunities. Uh, is that in general or linked to CWD sampling efforts? So the way that we framed it was around CWD management. So it was not everywhere. And again, we targeted them to, to different specific locations so that they're clearly tied in with chronic wasting disease management. Now, they would likely like more hunting opportunities in general. I mean, I think that's my general sense, again, from going to various meetings and such. But the way we were trying to identify the value was focused on management actions to address chronic wasting disease. Perfect. It looks like we have around six more minutes here. So I'll Okay. We cover some of these other questions. Um, let's see. Has there been much work done on the effectiveness of communications that may utilize the nostalgia of past hunting heritage versus more future forward messaging that protects the resource for future generations? And assuming that such targeted formats might be more applicable and or effective to certain groups of stakeholders. Um, I'm not sure if you have insight on that. 
Yeah, that's an interesting one. I don't know of any specific studies that have looked at that. There, there may be some. There, again, there, there are various um, pieces of literature in the risk communication area about communication strategies and what's effective in terms of conveying information. Um, some things work for some groups and not for other groups. I think, again, this is a, certainly an area open for research. You know, go back to the one place where some of that recent literature by Parley and others about, um, in particular, as an example, communication within Indigenous communities, that uh, the cultural norms around traditional knowledge really necessitate a different form of engagement and interaction and communication. Uh, that's pretty clear within that literature. And I think that's something that we can also think about in other contexts and in within other groups, whether it's a general public versus hunters. Hunters are certainly better informed about chronic wasting disease. So likely different communication strategies would be in play there. So. Perfect. Um, let's see, next question here. Um, do you think that perception of hunters towards CWD in provinces or states where CWD is established um, can affect perception of hunters in provinces, states that are trying to prevent introduction and or establishment of CWD um, and potentially affect the success of control measures. If so, how can public agencies minimize the impact of this perception coming from other provinces and or states? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'm, um, of course, it will depend on the extent to which the hunters are aware of, of perceptions and risks in other places. I think people are intrigued about uh, the extent to which other jurisdictions have had concerns and dealt with these types of issues. Um, and I'm sure that will influence risk perceptions and, and strategies around management. I think the best way to do it is to present the data as best we can and as transparently as we can of what, what we've learned. And that's, in a way, that's what my colleagues and I are trying to do with some of these presentations, describe what we're seeing in the data and what we've seen within the, the perceptions and actions by hunters. Um, but it, it, is a, it is a question. And again, we go back to this issue of information sources that People are looking at different information sources with different types of background and different pieces of information presented to them. And they're forming their perceptions likely based on those. So um, there will be a heterogeneity of responses to those different sources of information. I'm not sure that really answers the question, but I think you know the question is, will perceptions from other places influence my location? I'm, I'm sure the answer is yes. Um, communications are broad. There are studies available broadly. Um, people are interested in how other jurisdictions are handling these types of issues. So I think the answer is generally yes. Great. Um, let's see another question. Um, and maybe this has to do with kind of the, the perspective or the public perspective on things rather than uh, specific management actions. But uh, what COVID-19 response do you see as best translating over to CWD response in management? That's, that's a difficult question. Yeah. <laughs> We're putting you on the spot here. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of it has been uh, um, a lot of it has been communication of information, and uh, we've seen a variety of ways of communicating information of, about you know, even prevalence numbers and risk numbers and data and such. And I think there's some really good lessons learned there um, about transparency and just providing that data as raw data, but then with uh, kind of credible science backup as to interpretation of it, and that. That to me is one of the one of the lessons learned. The way that officers of public health have been providing this information in a relatively transparent fashion, and there's interesting work by the media in just trying to find ways to communicate and convey that, whether it's in infographics or in other types of uh, uh, visual presentation formats. I think that's a lesson that we could all learn in terms of presentation of risk and other types of information. Perfect. Well. Looks like we are rounding out the hour here. Um, I apologize to, to those who asked questions that we couldn't get to, um, but for the sake of time, we'll, we'll wrap this up. And I'm sure Vic, I know I am, am open to being emailed, uh, which is on our CIDREP website. I'm sure Vic would be more than happy not to, not to put words in his mouth to uh, answer any <laughs> questions you might have uh, after this presentation. But uh, Vic, I really wanted to personally thank you again for uh, taking the time to put this wonderful presentation together and to share some some of your knowledge with me and, and the viewers here. Um, I also want to thank the viewers who, who uh, took the time to register and, and to listen to this.
Um, again, if you want to view this webinar uh, or share it uh, afterwards, an archived version will be available on YouTube. Um, and will be featured on our, our CIDREP Resource Center webpage uh, at cidrep.umn.edu forward slash CWD. Um, so with that, thank you again, Vic, for this presentation uh, and your work on this topic. Um, and as, as a reminder, we will always be uh, hosting CWD webinars. So when we have information on future webinars um, and topics and, and dates, we will, we will forward that along to you. So thank you again, and I hope you all have a, a great day. Thanks. Thanks, Corey. And then just uh, just put up a set of references. So there's a pretty small font. If people want to find some of the sources, I, I think maybe that'll be helpful. And yeah, I'd, I'd welcome questions or comments or criticisms. Uh, I'd be happy to have those. And thanks again to you and to the folks who've joined us and listened in and asked for really good questions. Great. Thank you. Appreciate it.